since we were talking about different types of knowledge, then we want to do now a digression and talk about some of the different types of religious knowledge. And I think this is very beneficial. I really would like to expose you, brothers and sisters, um, to some of this information so that you have an idea about that. Some types of religious knowledge. You have belief, of course. Al-Aqidah, which means the creed, or at tawheed it's called ilm al the science of the creed, or ilm al-Tawheed, the, the, the knowledge or science of Tawheed, which is the oneness of Allah. The whole science of belief was called ilm al-Tawheed, the knowledge of Tawheed, because the oneness of Allah is the most important case in the knowledge of the creed. It's also called Ilmul Kalam, the knowledge of Kalam. Some said it's called Kalam because most of the debates of the old days were about the Kalam, the speech of Allah. And some said it's called Al Kalam, which means speech, because of the lengthy discussion and debate in this science. It was said about the definition of the knowledge of Kalam that it is that knowledge which deals with talking about or discussing the names of Allah, the attributes of Allah, and the doings of Allah, and the situations of the creations, such as the angels, the prophets, the awliya, we believe in the awliya, the imams, the creation of the world, the resurrection, and the like according to the religious fundamentals and not philosophy. Technically, the science of Kalam is the method of confirming the creedal doctrines, that means the matters of belief, by using the evidence. What evidence? One uses the textual evidence for those who agree with the validity of the religious law. The textual evidence means the verses of the Qur'an, the hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we're dealing with someone, say a Wahhabi, who claims to believe in the Qur'an and the Hadith, then we use textual evidence to substantiate the proper belief, and mental evidence for those who deny its validity. Those who deny that the Qur'an and the Hadith are valid evidence, such as atheists and philosophers, we still have a way to talk to them, that's by the mental evidence. Thus, the subject of this knowledge is referring to the creation with the purpose of confirming the existence of Allah and His perfect attributes, as well as referring to the religious texts from which the evidence is extracted. The evidence meaning the mental evidence. The mental evidence for us is extracted from the religious texts. This is what differentiates us from philosophers. Philosophers used their minds, and we use our minds. However, the philosopher has no basis for the use of his mind. He just uses his mind without a base before the use of his mind. For us, we have a basis for the use of our mind, which is the religious texts, the Quran and the Hadith. All of the mental arguments that we can make are all extracted from the Quran and the Hadith. Another time we can look into that. How did we know how to argue about the oneness of God? How did we know how to argue about the eternity of the Creator, that the Creator has no beginning? How did we know how to argue about the fact that the world has a beginning? All of that is taken from the Quran and the Hadith and not merely from our minds. And we do not call that Islamic philosophy. Rather, that's the science of Kalam, Ilmul Kalam. Thus, the subject of this knowledge is referring to the creation with the purpose of, of confirming the existence of Allah and His perfect attributes, as well as referring to the religious texts from which the evidence is extracted. The Kalam is centered around three things, thinking about the creations, to use that as evidence for the oneness of the Creator. 
meaning to make mental arguments. Two, the proofs of Ahlul Sunnah from the Quran and the Hadith and the arguments of Ahlul Sunnah. And three, refuting the heretics, the people of deviant beliefs. I would love to delve further into the meanings behind these sentences, but now is not the time for that. So just take the general meanings. Fiqh, technically, fiqh refers to the knowledge of the detailed rules of the acts of worship. This excludes the knowledge of the basics of the creed. The knowledge of the creed is not called fiqh. These rules are extracted from the detailed texts that specify those rules. So fiqh is the knowledge of the detailed rules that are taken from the detailed texts. The detailed rules that are taken from the detailed texts. Such as the saying of Allah. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu idha kuntum ila salati faghsilu wujuhakum faghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al marafiq wa amsahu bi ru'usikum wa arjulikum or wa arjulakum ila al ka'bayn which means all oh, those who have believed if you stood to pray wash your faces and hands to the elbows Wipe your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. That's a detailed text because it spells out the rules for wudu. The details of wudu. We mentioned also the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the man who prayed his prayer invalidly when the man said. لا أحسن غيره فعلمني. I don't know how to do better than this, so teach me. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم said, إذا كنت إلى الصلاة فاستقبل القبلة وكبر. If you stood to pray, then face the qibla and say الله أكبر. ثم قرأ ما تيسر معك من القرآن. Then recite whatever is easy for you of the Quran. ثُمَّ رُكَعْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ رَاكِعًا Then bow until you are tranquil, until you are still. ثُمَّ رُفَعْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ قَائِمًا Then raise up until you are standing still. ثُمَّ اثْجُدْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ سَاجِدًا Then prostrate until you are still. ثُمَّ رُفَعْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ جَالِسًا Then raise up until you are sitting still. ثم اسجد حتى تطمئن ساجدا. Then prostrate until you are still. ثم فعل ذلك في صلاتك كلها. And then do that throughout your prayer, throughout the rakahs of your prayer. So fiqh is the detailed rules taken from the detailed texts. It is the knowledge of the religious rules that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came with. It may be referred to as the Sharia. Fiqh does not pertain to the general rules from which these detailed rules are deduced. That would be the knowledge called Usulul Fiqh. So, Fiqh is not the knowledge of the general rules taken from the general proofs. Fiqh is the detailed rules taken from the detailed texts. So then, what is excluded by this wording? Why are we saying it like that? Because there are general proofs. Not proofs that give detailed acts, but proofs evidence but in a general way meaning what proves that the act is an obligation or that it's not an obligation or that it's forbidden or not forbidden or recommended or if the judgment is general 
or if the judgment is restricted or specific or if the judgment is lifted and is not applicable anymore this is called usul al usul so um, I have here something I'm sure that the the font is not very clear sorry about that but I know it's there so I'm going to read it inshallah foundations or fundamentals usul of fiqh the fundamentals of fiqh or foundations of fiqh usul al fiqh usul means fundamentals basis or basics of fiqh that's a knowledge different from the knowledge of fiqh itself in the explanation of al waraqat which al waraqat is a small booklet in usul al fiqh that's like your beginner's booklet for the one who's learning usul al fiqh for the first time al waraqat is a small booklet in Usul al Fiqh written by Imam al Haramain and was explained by several scholars. Among them was the Maliki scholar Al Ra'ini. Imam al Haramain, he's a Shafi'i. Al Ra'ini, he's a Maliki and he wrote an explanation for Al Waraqat. He said, The knowledge of the foundations of Fiqh. For which these pages are dedicated, these pages refers to the, the book Al Waraqat. Al Waraqat means pages. So the knowledge of Usul al Fiqh for which these pages are dedicated refer to Fiqh's general references. Not the detailed references, the general references. Like what? Like the talk about the unrestricted order and prohibition. The doings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the consensus, the qiyas, the analogical deduction, the inclusive, the specific, the general, the clarification, and other matters. I and mean, what does that mean? It means usul al-fiqah is not the knowledge of the detailed rules. Rather, usul al-fiqah is um, the fundamentals. It's it's the knowledge that's behind those detailed rules, okay? If you think about it like a clock, the clock from the outside you see something, which is what? You see a face with numbers or nudges that represent the numbers and hands that are pointing at the numbers to tell you what time it is. And those hands are turning so that you can know what time it is as time passes. That's the clock. That's fiqa. What you see from the outside, that's the fiqh. That's what we apply when we pray and we fast, etc. We do zakah when we sell and buy and get married. What's the judgment to this? What's the judgment to that? Is it permissible if a person does this or that? That's fiqh. But behind that face and behind those turning hands, there's a lot of clockwork. There's a lot of things turning inside and behind there that make the clock work as it does. That's the usul, the fundamentals. So usul al-fiqh is like the clockwork behind the fiqh. Like the talk about the unrestricted order and prohibition. For example, what does that mean, unrestricted order? I don't want to go too far, but I'm going to try to make you understand what this, all this discussion is about. For example, in a hadith, a Bedouin, a desert Arab, came and he urinated in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He urinated in the masjid on the floor, on the ground. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told them, pour a bucket of water over it. Okay. Simple enough. Pour a bucket of water over it. However, there's proof in this hadith. This hadith is evidence that it's obligatory to use water for cleaning najasa. This hadith is evidence that it's obligatory to use water for cleaning najasa. Huh. A person might say, who told you you have to use water to clean najasa? We'll say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the 
Bedouin urinated in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the companions, pour a bucket of water over it. So the person might say, well, it doesn't say it's obligatory. Where does it say it's obligatory? Where does it say you can't do something else? We say, however, in that hadith, there is a command. A command. And the command is a general proof. A general proof. And the command, if it's not restricted, that is, if there's no evidence to say otherwise, then the command is evidence of an obligation. The command is evidence of an obligation. So when the Prophet wasallam said, pour a bucket of water over it, then that means there's an obligation in there because he gave a command. This is usul al-fiqah. Like the talk of the unrestricted order, meaning the command, and the prohibition. Like when Mu'adh ibn Jabal came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he prostrated to the Messenger of Allah. What did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say to him? He said, La taf'al, do not do that. That's called nahi, a prohibition. And the nahi is evidence. Evidence for what? That it's haram. If there is no proof to show that this prohibition is restricted, then it's evidence for a sin that is haram. And that's why there are a number of things that a person might be surprised that the scholar said this is obligatory. And he would think to himself, well, why would that be obligatory? It would be because of the way the, way the hadith is worded. Why some scholars said it's obligatory to make tawaf before you leave Mecca, even if you're not a pilgrim. You, They said you, it, it's haram to leave Mecca without making tawaf. Even if you're not making Hajj, because the Prophet ﷺ said, no one leaves Mecca without making Tawaf. So based on the way that is worded, that's why some of them said this is an obligation. What can we do with that hadith? Look how the Prophet said it. We know the rules, we know the usul, you know how the usul works, that means it's an obligation then. And the consensus, al ijma, and the analogical deduction, meaning al qiyas, the ijma is evidence. What's the evidence that angels are not males or females? Ijma. The analogical deduction, al qiyas. Qiyas is evidence. Qiyas is religious evidence. Is there? Zakah on the money of the child. Some said, well, it's money, so there's zakah. So they're, they looked at it from one point of view. Some said, well, the owner of the money is a child. The child has no obligations, so there's no zakah on it. They looked from another way. So it's, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to go far. Kiyas. And the inclusive, and the specific, and the general, and the clarification, and other matters. Not to go into every single one of them. Because now, I just want to give you an idea. For example, is it valid to restrict an ayah of the Qur'an by a hadith of the Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, they differed about that. It depends. According to those who said you can, they arrived at different rules. Those who said you cannot, they arrived at other rules. Because their fundamentals were different. So the result was different. And their particular cases upon conflict, given priority to the specific over the inclusive, and to the restricted over the absolute and other issues. What does that mean? For example, easy example. 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa kullu bid'atin dalala. Every innovation is misguidance. If you want to translate it literally. But didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasanatan falahu ajiruha. Whoever starts a good sunnah in Islam will have its reward. Then, there appears to be a conflict here. So then, one of these two texts would be given priority over the other. One of them would be used to restrict the other. That's why he said giving priority to the specific over the inclusive and to the restricted over the absolute and other issues. That is, for example, we're not going to ignore من سن في الإسلام سنة حسنة whoever starts a good sunnah in Islam for وكل بدعة ضلالة every innovation is a misguidance rather the one who applies the fundamentals the foundations the basics of fiqh he would say that وكل بدعة ضلالة every innovation is misguidance is restricted to the bad innovation because of another hadith. This is usul al fiqh. So, as you can, I hope, understand now, usul al fiqh is the clockwork behind the fiqh. Toyb, I'm just going to skip the rest of that, that little paragraph. Inshallah, you took the understanding. Okay? Maybe someday we can go over usul al fiqh. Maybe, perhaps, make dua. I mean, Quranic sciences. There are several branches of knowledge related to the Quran. Among them is the knowledge of its various recitations. The Quran is revealed according to recitations. So knowing the recitations of the Quran is a knowledge in itself. Which among them are, which among them, which of those recitations are narrated by Tawatur? And which are said to be Ahad, not by Tawatur, but still Sahih? And which are Shad, Ad recitations that are not permissible to be recited? And among them, meaning among the Quranic sciences, is the knowledge of writing the Mus'haf. The book of the Qur'an has its own script. The way of writing the Qur'an is not the way of, re of writing regular Arabic. The greatest book compiled in reference to the different aspects of the Qur'anic sciences is the book of As-Suyuti Al-Itqan. Al-Itqan fi ulum al-Qur'an. Interpretation, tafsir. This includes many types of knowledge. Among them is the knowledge of where, when, and why the chapters and verses were revealed. That's important for knowing the meanings of those um, ayat. It includes knowing what verses are abrogating or abrogated. Yani which verses nullify, erase, or lift. Let's use the word lift. Which verses lift the judgments of other verses? The rulings that are in the Quran, because the, the Quran has judgments in it, the Quran has belief in it, aqidah, the Quran has stories in it. The merits of the different chapters of the Quran, like for example, Surah Al Mulk. If you recite Surah Al Mulk, it's a reason for you to be protected from the torture of the grave. Suratul Kahf, reciting from Suratul Kahf, is a reason for a person to be protected from the harm of the Dajjal, etc. Suratul Waqi'ah is said that is a, a reason for a person to be protected from poverty. Suratul Ikhlas, reciting Suratul Ikhlas, is like reciting one third of the Quran. So, it includes also the knowing the merits of the different chapters of the Qur'an. 
and the terms in the Quran that may be unfamiliar to many. That's called Gharib, the Gharib of the Quran. Gharib, it means the words of the Quran that are likely to be unfamiliar to many. But most of the Quran is clear. For someone who knows Arabic, most of the Quran is clear. Among that is knowing the, mir the miraculous aspects of the Quran and its syntax, knowing the syntax of the Quran or the grammar if you want. And the difference between its decisive and ambiguous verses. The decisive verses are the verses that can have only one meaning. The ambiguous verses are the verses who, whose meanings are unclear or that could have more than one meaning, as well as many other matters. Whoever does not know these matters cannot interpret the Book of Allah. So don't let some ignorant person who doesn't even know Arabic sit there and start explaining the Qur'an from his opinion. Recitation, Qira'ah. This includes the knowledge of Tajweed, and the knowledge of the exits of the letters and knowing about the rules of stopping while reciting as well as other matters that's those are Quranic sciences then there's also the science of hadith the knowledge of hadith is divided into two branches riwaya narration and diraya terminology the first type does not stand independently of the second. That means just referring to the books of hadith narration like Bukhari and Muslim is not good enough when a person is ignorant about the terminology of the people of hadith. If he does not have diraya, the terminology, then he should not busy himself with the riwayah with the narration of the hadith and the diraya of hadith the terminology is basically usulul hadith didn't we just finish talking about usulul fiqh well diraya ilmul diraya which is ilmul mustalah hadith terminology is usulul hadith like usulul fiqh is the the fundamentals for the science of fiqh Diraya is usulul hadith, the fundamentals for the science of hadith. So, hadith narration, this is the knowledge that includes narrating the sayings and doings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with their different narrations along with verifying their vowels and the verification of their expressions. So the one who truly and correctly busies himself with hadith narration will have the vowels of his words, the harakat of his words verified, especially the names of people. This is the definition presented by Ibn al-Akfani in his book Al-Maqasid. Included in this branch are the six top books of hadith and their likes. So, Al-Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, and nasai At-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, those six books fall under this category. Hadith narration, riwayah. Included under this science is the knowledge of the explanation of the hadiths, like... Uh, Fathul Bari, the explanation of Sahih al Bukhari, and Imam Al Nawawi's explanation of Sahih Muslim, and the knowledge of the narrated supplications, and the knowledge of the narrated supplications. So, included in this science of narration is the knowledge of the du'as. Many scholars have busied themselves with documenting just the du'as that came from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the formulas, the awrad, like to say this 100 times, to say that 7 times, etc. And the knowledge of the Prophet's biography. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for the other branch of hadith knowledge, it is hadith terminology, diraya or mustalah. The subject of this knowledge is the text of the hadith and the chain of the hadith. Izzuddin ibn Abdul Jama'ah said about the knowledge of hadith, it is a knowledge of a set of rules by which the situations of the text and the chain are known, whether correct or authentic, sahih, good or strong, hasan or weak, da'if, whether the chain had few narrators, ulu, or many narrators, nuzul, how it was received, tahammul, and conveyed, ada, the qualities of the narrators, are they, for example, scholars, are they liars, and the like. Ibn al-Akthani said about this branch of hadith knowledge, it is a knowledge by which the reality of the narration is known, as well as its types, its judgments, and the situation of the narrators, and their conditions, and the types of books of narration, and whether and whatever else is related to that. As Suyuti explains these terms, he said, the reality of the narrations refers to the transmission, the naql of the sunnah, and the like, and its chain is snad back to whomever it was attributed. The conditions refer to the method by which the narrator acquired his narration, whether it was among what he heard, sama'ah, or it was presented to him, like the student came to the shaykh and said, can I read these hadiths on you? So it was presented to him. Or he acquired permission to narrate, ijazah, and the like. Its types refer to the hadiths with a continuous chain of narration, multasil, or those with a broken chain, munqatir, and the like. The judgments of the hadith refer to whether the hadith is accepted and hence must be applied, maqbul, or is it rejected, mardud, the situation of the narrators refers to whether they are considered reliable, adala, or whether they are discredited, jarh. The types of books of narration, marwiyat, refer to the books organized according to the chains of narration, musnad, or those hadith books that are organized like dictionaries, mu'ajam, or the books dedicated to a specific case or a specific hadith, a juzu, and the like. And whatever, and, and what is meant by whatever is related to that is the knowledge of the terminology and jargon of the people of hadith. The purpose of this knowledge is to know the difference between what is authentic and what is not. The Arabic language, al lughatul arabiya is the best of languages and among the original languages revealed to Adam. Hence it is not derived from Hebrew. Arabic language is not derived from Hebrew. Another original language revealed to Adam, Hebrew. As the blasphemers say, out of hatred and lies, their hatred for Islam and their hatred for Arabs, they lied and said Arabic is derived from Hebrew. Some scholars have counted up to 10 branches of knowledge within the Arabic language. Each branch so vast that one could spend his entire life mastering one of them. Among them are Nahu, syntax or grammar. I think syntax is a better word for Nahu than grammar. Some disagreed with me, but I am still not convinced because grammar and what I know and understand grammar is more general than syntax G grammar includes all all the different types of linguistic rules how to spell um, how to conjugate etc all of that is called grammar how to pronounce all of that is grammar syntax is the knowledge of how words in a sentence relate to each other. And that's what Nahu is. 
Nahu is the knowledge of how the words relate to each other. Nahu is the most important science in the Arabic language and the bridge to all of the different branches of the religious knowledge. Nahu is Jisrul Uloom. Nahu is the bridge to the different fields of knowledge. The one who learns Nahu well can understand many, many things. May Allah grant you the knowledge of Nahu. Linguistically, Nahu means to intend or to go towards. According to the terminology of the scholars, it refers to that knowledge of rules by which the situations of the cases of the words would be known. The case of the word is whether it's, in English we would say subjective or accusative or genitive. Those are English words. In Arabic we would say, is it in a state of rafa? Is it in a state of nasub? Is it in a state of jar? And none of that is difficult. So don't feel overwhelmed because you're not familiar with those words. It's just a matter of learning. The purpose of this knowledge is the empowerment of understanding the Quran and the Hadith. That means the purpose of, of Nahu, the goal behind learning Nahu is being able to understand the Quran and the Hadith. Its benefit is knowing the difference between correct and incorrect speech. For example, in the Quran we are told that if the blasphemers were asked, what did Allah reveal? They would say, awwalin, Tales of the ancients, stories from the old people. And if the believers were asked, what did Allah reveal? They would say, Khaira, goodness. However, the one who understands Nahu understands that actually, what are the blasphemers saying? If they were asked, what did Allah reveal? If they said, Asatirul Awwaleen, tales of the ancients, what they're saying is, Allah didn't reveal anything. They're not saying Allah revealed tales of the ancients. They're saying He didn't reveal anything. Because there's a Dhamma. Asatirul Awwaleen. What it really means that they're saying, it's not revelation. It's just stories of the old people. So if you just look at the, the, the words themselves, if the blasphemers were asked, what did Allah reveal? They would say, Stories of the old people. What they mean is, what's implied is, Allah did not reveal anything according to them. It's nothing but stories from the old people. If someone understands Nahu, he would grab that. He would realize that. And if the believers were asked, what did Allah reveal? They would say, Khaira, because there's a fatha. So it means they're saying Allah revealed goodness. It's revelation. Now, it's not, I'm, I haven't explained that as well and clearly as I would like to. But I hope that, inshallah, it gives you some sort of an idea. But why I'm saying that? Because I said there's a dhamma there. But what does that mean? That part I'm not explaining. And then I said the other one, there's a fatha there. So what? There's a fatha there. So that's the part that's missing from my explanation to you. So it could be even clearer, but now I cannot go into it. Sarf, conjugation or inflection or morphology as some people say. Abu al-Fadail Izzuddin Abdul Wahhab al-Zanjani said in defying, defining this science, know that tasrif linguistically means to change. In this field, it is the altering of an origin into different derivatives for the purpose of expressing meanings that would not take place except by such alteration. What does that mean? Saying, sarf is the knowledge of the structures of the words, not how the words relate to each other, the knowledge of the structures of the words. 
He said, Tasrif or Sarf, it linguistically means to change. And in this field of knowledge, it is alter, it is the altering of an origin. Take an origin, such as Darb, hit, into different derivatives, such as Daraba, he hit, Yadribu, he hits, Darib, hitter, Madrub, hitted. So taking that origin, and from that origin, arriving, changing that origin to arrive at different derivatives for the purpose of expressing meanings that would not take place, those meanings would not take place except by such alteration. So darb is a hit. But if I want to talk about an action that took place in the past, I would have to say daraba. I have to change the harakat. If I want to talk about an action taking place in the present or that will take place in the future, I have to say yadribu. If I want to talk about the one who does the hit, I say darib. If I talk about the one who received the hit, I say madrub. If I want to command you to hit, I'll say idrib. So sarf is the altering of an origin into different derivatives for the purpose of expressing meanings that would not take place except by such alteration. Hence this knowledge deals with the structure of words not their syntactical relationships. It is the second most important knowledge after Nahu. So was that clear, brothers and sisters, about Sarf? Got a general idea of Sarf? Toy Balava, eloquence. Linguistically, Balava refers to reaching an end. According to the terminology of the scholars, it is to bring the far concepts close, meaning to bring those profound um, ideas closer to the understanding. Refrain from it, so it is to bring the far concepts close, refrain from using unnecessary expressions, use few terms to express vast meaning. while using words that are easily uttered not hard to pronounce familiar not unfamiliar and in compliance with the rules of inflection sarf you'll pardon me if inflection is not the best word so using the word in the wrong with the wrong structure and not in compliance with the rules of sarf weakens the eloquence okay the more that one's expressions have these qualities the more eloquent it is so balagha is bringing the far concepts close refraining from using unnecessary expressions using few terms to express vast meaning like when Allah says, "Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad." This is very balir, very eloquent, because the meanings contained in these four ayat are vast. We could write a booklet in explanation of these four very brief lines. How long does it take to recite that? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٍ لَمْ يَلِدِ وَلَمْ يُولَدٍ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ Not even 10 seconds. We could write a booklet on the meanings in, that, in those lines without digression even. Without even digressing into secondary subjects. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ and that there's lots of meanings. Or like when the Prophet said, Can Allahu alam yakun shay'un ghayruhu? And that there's so much meaning. Allah existed and nothing else existed. So refraining from using unnecessary expressions, using few terms to express vast meaning while using words that are easily uttered. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. 
لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم واليدين is very بليغ the Quran has the highest بلاغة while using words that are easily uttered, familiar, and in compliance with the rules of inflection, sarf. Balagha was called as such because it makes the meaning reach the heart of the listener. And thus, he understands what was intended. Some scholars said that Balagha is wisdom conveyed with brevity. Some said that it is abundant knowledge in few expressions. The highest level of Balagha is found in the Qur'an. And some verses of the Qur'an are more Balagh than others. Some verses of the Qur'an have higher level of Balagha than others. However, all of the Qur'an is at the highest level of Balagha. The highest level of Balagha is found in the Qur'an and then in the speech of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger of Allah, his speech is is the highest balagha of all the creatures. And the Qur'an, the Book of Allah, is not the speech of a human. The Qur'an, the Book of Allah, is not the speech of a human. It is the highest balagha and it's not the speech of a human. The speech of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the highest balagha. It's the highest speech of a creature. And then after the Messenger of Allah, the old Arabs, their speech is the highest of speech, strongest balagha. Then after the old Arabs come, the scholars of Islam. The highest level of balagha is found in the Qur'an and then in the speech of the Messenger of Allah. Learning this knowledge enables one to see the miracle of the Qur'an. The more balagha one knows, the more he can see the Qur'an is miraculous. Allah Ta'ala told us about the brothers of Yusuf. You know the story of Yusuf. And how the brothers of Yusuf, they threw Yusuf in the well. And then they lied to their father and said he was eaten by the wolf. And they came to meet him later by the will of Allah Ta'ala. And... They didn't know he was Yusuf. So then when they finally found out he was Yusuf, Allah told us, قَالُوا أَإِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ Yusuf." Wow! The one who understands? You say, wow, they were so surprised. قَالُوا أَإِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ Yusuf." There's so much emphasis in this, just in that little bit. أَإِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ Yusuf." Innaka, inna has emphasis. Innaka, is it you? Innaka la anta, alam la anta. This lamb has emphasis. Anta means you. Anta you. Innaka, the calf means you. Qalu innaka la anta. Inna is for emphasis. The lamb is for emphasis. The calf means you, and anta means you. Qalu a'innaka la'anta Yusuf As if they're saying Is it, is it you? Is, is it really? Are you Yusuf? But if you look in the translation It probably just says They said Are you Yusuf? And the person would not Recognize really the power Of the statement that's there I wonder how does that say Inshallah Maybe somebody would take a look In one of those Some of those translations Let's see how did they translate that most likely just says, they said, are you Yusuf? Or maybe it might say something like, they said, is it you? Are you Yusuf? That would be closer. Is it you? Are you Yusuf? Surat Yusuf. It's towards the end. I'm not sure the number of the ayah. But it's when they found out he was Yusuf. Uh, they came back. To ask him to give their brother back. Yusuf, he took their brother Binyamin from them. Then they went back home and they told their father that their brother stole. And their father was so sad 
the Prophet Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam that he went blind. Then they went back to Egypt just to ask Yusuf to, to, to be charitable and give their brother back. They said, please, our father has been greatly harmed. Just give us a charity and give us our brother back. Then he said to them, do you know what you did to Yusuf and, their bro and his brother? That's when they knew it was him. So they said, Yusuf. The knowledge of the inner purification, tasawwuf, manners, akhlaq, and merits, fadail. The knowledge of tasawwuf is misrepresented by some who claim Islam, and that misrepresentation is propagated by the non-Muslims who hate Islam and seek to defame it and wage war against it. They call it Islamic mysticism. Because of this misrepresentation, the Wahhabiya have categorically denied the validity of Tasawwuf. They said it's completely invalid. Ahlu Sunnah are in the middle, not deniers like the Wahhabiya, nor defamers like the people who believe in the absolute unity, so called Al Wahdatul Mutlaqah. It includes the knowledge of the secrets of the acts of worship and the knowledge of the ordinary acts such as eating and marriage knowing the secrets in those things. It also includes the knowledge of the praiseworthy traits such as sincerity, reliance on Allah, self-observation, as well as the knowledge of the destructive attributes and the sicknesses of the heart, the tongue, the organs, and the sicknesses of the dunya. Included among these sciences is the knowledge of the merits of the companions and their followers and whoever followed them in goodness the conditions of the shaykh, who's the murshid, the guiding one, and the conditions of the murid, the one who seeks to benefit from the shaykh, and the relationship between them, as well as the knowledge of the Sufi tariqas. And Allah wa ta'ala knows best.